Hey everybody, just me again, Wayne. This is the second part of my group chat about bodybuilding with, alphabetically, Doug Brignoli, Steve Green, and John Taylor. Especially stuff to think about and stuff to do and not to do if you're considering entering your first bodybuilding competition. I hope you watched the first part of the discussion. If you didn't, feel free to do that. Here's the second part of the talk. I hope you like it. And I would ask you, gentlemen, if, if someone is, they're considering competing, what advice would you give them about, uh, about self-assessment, whether it's physically or emotionally or mentally, you know, bef before they send in the money? You're, you're talking about someone in a situation such as yourself, it's their, their first competition. Yes. Well, I, I, would, I would say that they need to be, ensure that they're committed to following, following it through. Um, and it's not going to be just a matter of, you know, we've been talking about practicing posing, but there's also the dietary component, um, the actual training itself. Um, I, I, you just, you just need to make sure that you, you, you're committed to following it through. That's, that's, that's the main thing. Um, you but know, go ahead. I was just going to say, you know, um, the idea of looking in the mirror and, and deciding what needs to be broader, what needs to be narrower. The fact is you, you don't have that much control, right? So you're putting your training in high gear anyway, right? So you're already training to max. So you can't then look in the mirror and say, oh, well, you know, my shoulders need to be wider. I'm going to work my shoulders harder. The assumption is you're already slamming your shoulders, right? How do you do better than that, yeah. right? My waist needs to be narrow. Well, you're going to be dieting. You're going to be stripping your body fat off. You can't do better than that, right? So just put your training in high gear. Don't miss, I mean, you look in the mirror for the sake of knowing how to present yourself, but you shouldn't be looking in the mirror with the idea that you're going to somehow alter your training based on what you're seeing in the mirror, because the assumption is your training is already in highest gear. There's nothing more you can do than the most you're doing. So, um, and don't look in the mirror with the idea that if things aren't looking good enough, I'm going to get out because as John said, you're committed. You've, you've, you've made that, that determination, you put your foot down, you're gonna do this no matter what. So you shouldn't be looking in the mirror for like, well, should I or shouldn't I? That's a done deal already. And, and enjoy the journey. Yeah. Um, so that's the most, that's the biggest thing. Just, just have fun. You know, I, I, I once was saying, I found it to be very true that true happiness is found in the pursuit of happiness. And um, for me, that, that applied um, a number of times throughout my life where the thought of what was about to come, the aspirations for getting there, just it was euphoric. Um, sometimes a little anticlimactic once I, once I arrived, but, um, but you know, it's, it's the biggest thing is just have fun. I mean, you'll go down this path. We only get the opportunity so many times in life. So make the most of it. And bodybuilding is, is part reality and part illusion. When you're being prejudged, that's the reality part. You're standing up there with a bunch of other guys. You're hitting these mandatory poses. Nobody's focused on just you. Um, they're focused on everybody. And so when you're in the lineup, it's, it's pretty easy mentally to do that. It's no big deal. You're just out there with a bunch of other guys. Where it gets tough is when you come up to do your individual posing routine because now everybody's focused on you you're by yourself and that's where the illusion comes in bodybuilding is a show of illusion <clears throat> everybody has weak parts of them strong parts weak poses strong poses so what you have to determine is what's the illusion what can i do to make myself look better bigger than i than i actually am like for myself i'm not genetically gifted um for bodybuilding, uh, you know, like John and Doug, I have narrow shoulders, small bones. I got a big head. I got a lot of things going against me. So what I, and, and if I ask myself, am I good enough? I would say I'm never good enough because I'm not going to look like the other guys. But so you have to determine uh, how can I fool the audience? You can't fool the judges, the, the prejudging, the lineup, that's reality. But as far as the illusion where everybody's focused on only you, that's where you can play with the illusion and don't do poses that you don't look good in. <laughs> you know, don't let that part of you show. You, you have to hide that. So you become very adept at hiding the weaknesses 
and accentuating your strengths. All of which is being done now, right? You don't discover those things mm-hmm. the day of the contest. By the time the contest arrives, you should already know right. how to create that illusion or how to hide your weaknesses and things like that. Right. The other thing I was going to say mm-hmm. too was, you know, um, let's start off with the assumption that you're never going to miss a workout and your workouts are always going to be the best they can be. That combined with your genetics will deliver on that stage the best possible you that you could have brought. Right. So the idea that you're going to stand on that stage and worry about whether you're good enough is silly. Yeah. Right? Because you brought your best. Yeah. That's it. You brought your best, right? And if you aren't good enough mm-hmm. as compared to the other people, then it's genetics or it's time, right? It's it's how much time has been invested so far. But either way, um, as John said, this is why you just say, I'm going to have fun because there's nothing I can do mm-hmm. different. The outcome is not going to be influenced by, you know, worrying. So don't worry, right? Look at it from the perspective of 20, 30 years from now, when you're looking back at your contest, your pictures and your videos, and you're saying, you know, I, I, I made dramatic changes to my physique to be on that stage that day. I'm very proud of those changes, right? right? Don't begrudge the fact that somebody showed up who happened to have better genetics. You had no control over that. So you might as well just have fun. And Wayne, also, you might want to be prepared. Uh, this is kind of a common occurrence. Uh, maybe three weeks out from your competition, you may feel like this isn't happening fast enough. My diet isn't working. My training may not be delivering the results that I hoped that they would. But that's that's pretty common. And just just understand that by the time your competition comes, if you've done all the right preparation, you're you're going to be where you need to be for that day. Makes sense. Those are those are three really insightful. As I cover up my mouth and show that those are three really insightful and good good comments. Things to take to heart. And uh, and guys, you've actually uh, anticipated the next question I had for you, which was okay. If someone's considering uh, competing, what do they do to to mentally or emotionally uh, self assess? It, not worrying, right, overly much, and realizing that when you get there, if you've been training and, and eating as well as you can, that, you know, you know, what you bring is what you bring. Something that, um, and I don't, I don't think that this was an original thought with me, but I can't remember where I came across it first. I am fully prepared to finish dead last in my category or league or, or whatever it is. And, and I'm, I'm okay with that. I mean, I'd rather not, you know, one wants to do as, as well as one can. But if I do, I'm like, well, okay, that's all right. I came, I did the thing, you know, I did my best, and and there you go. I know that, you know, I know that, you know, that Wayne did what Wayne can do. And the suggestion that uh, I made in uh, one of my videos about this journey to anyone considering it is, uh, yeah, do be prepared to come in last. You know, I mean, if you're not okay with that, if you're not going to finish as high as you want, and then you're going to have a fit about it, whether it's externally or just internally, well, then don't do it. You know, By the way, let's just say you don't finish last. Let's just say you finish second or third from last, just hypothetically. Right. And the reason for that is because a couple of guys showed up that let's say didn't put much preparation into it or only started training for this thing a month ago or had very bad genetics or whatever. That doesn't mean you actually did better. Right. So it goes back to this whole issue of comparison being irrelevant. Right. If you don't place last because somebody really bad showed up, <clears throat> it's no more a reason to feel good than it is a reason to feel bad if you place last. Because the circumstances on that stage are not within your control. The only right. thing within your control is your training, your preparation. So rather than saying, how did I compare with the other people on that stage that day? The best thing to do is say, how do I compare with where I started? And did I work as hard as I could? There was a motivational speaker uh, named um, John may know who, actually both John and Steve might know who this guy is. He was a gold medal pole vault Olympic winner. Um, and he was a preacher. And his name was uh, Bob Richards. And he was a motivational speaker. And a long time ago, a friend of mine gave me one of his uh, audio tapes. And he says, there can be defeat and victory and victory and defeat, 
depending on your preparation. If you lose, meaning you didn't get the gold or you didn't get what you wanted to get, but you trained as hard as you could, you are victorious. Mm -hmm. And if you win, but you didn't train as hard as you could, you lost. You only won by accident. You only won because nobody else better showed up. But if you can't take the credit for your training because you held back. So ultimately, the contest is, as John said, in the preparation. That's the contest. It's not what happens on the stage. That's completely circumstantial. Yeah, I agree 100 percent, Doug. I, I would say, Wayne, if you if you do everything in your in, in your ability to, to get ready for this show, you can declare your own personal victory. Exactly. Regardless of where you place. Well, there, there is no failure in these shows the way I see it. Like, like the other guys have said, I mean, you've done the best you can. You've come a long way. And I think what John said is a really valid point about enjoying it and having fun. I mean, you have to place having fun and enjoying the, ex the life experience as the number one thing. You can't sit there and be concerned about, oh, geez, I, you know, I got a place in the top three. You know, it doesn't matter. I started these contests. You know, I was at Pearls at the time, and you know, Doug was there, and um, there's there were guys that were were competing, and we'd go to shows together in a group. You know, we'd carpool down, and right. and the guys in the audience. It made it really easy for me uh, from this fear standpoint that we have brewing in our heads. You know, am I going to be good enough? Because you get out on there and stage, and the guys in Pearls are out there, and. You know, I had a, a friend, Jim Morris, who would take pictures of me and help me with the assessments. And, you know, I mean, those guys are all clapping for you. And and just the clapping for you when you're out there posing is just such a high. It doesn't matter if you <laughs> where you place. You come away feeling great after the contest. You all stop at a Denny's Cafe or something. You eat a, two or three dinners to make up for your yeah, deficit right. for the last few weeks, you know, and you had a great time. And. What do, you, what do you remember? Well, if you got a trophy, that's great. You can put it on yourself. But you remember the, the great camaraderie with, with all the other guys and gals who were part of the gym scene. And even when I competed in Colorado, it was the same thing. I was in my 40s, but, you know, there's got, everybody from the gym would come. <clears throat> and, you know, they're, yay, Steve, you know, <laughs> even though I'm, I'm not the biggest guy, you know. So, yeah, yeah. have fun. Yeah. yeah. That's all, that's all great advice. And it's the, so really it sounds like the, the event, the real event is that whole process from, you know, deciding to do it and going through the months of training and dieting and whatever. And the actual contest, the actual, you know, those, those few minutes on stage, that's not the event. That's right. just the la that's just the smallest, yeah. smallest portion of the whole experience. So right. yeah, that makes sense. As far as, as uh, people in the audience clapping and, and uh, you know, giving, giving one positive feedback that way, um, I'm going to have to make sure that, that my wife is there <laughs> and, and that my granddaughter is there. Pack the audience. <laughs> because Pack it, the well, audience, yeah. The rest of my family <laughs> are, I mean, my, my family, they're all Midwesterners. So, you know, so most of us are the, the most excited we will allow ourselves to show in public. It's like, very nice, very nice. Yes, good. So, so I'll need to get a couple of folks there who'll actually yell. So, um, well, speaking of diet, I said, as though we were, oh, by the way, and I noticed that, uh, Steve, when you said that after the contest, you stop at a Denny's or someplace and you eat, you know, basically two or three dinners worth of food. They got a huge grin from both uh, Doug and John. <laughs> you guys are both. Yeah. That's, how it goes. That's, that's Yeah. It's part of the tradition. We always did that. I mean, that was the most fun part of the night. Cause you're sitting there with, with the other guys and gals that went out on stage and maybe different divisions, but you all had the experience. You got all this food coming in and you're finally not starving. And you, you get to sit there at the, at the big round table there in Denny's or wherever. And you share, you share your highlights and you share this, and you share that. It's just great. Then you go back to the gym the you know, following week or whatever. And people ask how you did. And you're kind of a celebrity, you know, and it, it's fun. It's yeah. fun. Yeah, although, Steve, I wonder how much that happens now because the it gym may scene, not. It is yeah. the gym scene isn't what the gym scene used to be. Now people are working out at home. You're all right. All You're right, Doug. And I've wondered about that because I, I gave I give that advice 
but it may not be the same. There may not, you know, I don't know, Wayne, where you train, uh, but uh, you may not have any kind of a tight knit group at Pearl's where I started. I mean, Doug was there, you yeah. know, and uh, it was like this. I mean, yeah. we got advice from the top guys and, and, you know, physiologically, it always wasn't the best advice as Doug will attest, yeah. but we got this advice and there, and it was like this, you know, and the bigger guys, they know you had a contest. They're, they're spurring you on. They want to see you compete and, and they're helpful. And they all go to the contest with you. It's like a family. And Doug, you bring up a good point. I have no idea if it's like that anymore. Yeah. I mean, things are really weird nowadays. I think and Wayne did tell me he goes to a, a, a commercial, a public gym. Yeah, I go to the, the, the I work local. Out of the garage uh, yeah, it's it's the, the local uh, community center, and uh, you, have, you have buddies there that uh, that know you. You guys share laughs. You guys? Uh, no, not really. Now there are several several guys there that I know, and um, I, I take a long time to make friends. I'm a fairly reserved person, and uh, you know, speaking in public is is not my best thing. You're talking to people that I don't know is not my best thing, which is weird since I'm a teacher. You think. Dude, what profession should you not have chosen? This one. <laughs> but uh, but there are several guys that that I do know uh, there. And uh, a couple of whom, I, I, actually, I, I said, hey, can I interview you for my YouTube channel? And both of them were like, that would be so embarrassing. And I'm like, no, dude, it totally won't. But uh, but no, there's not really like a, a tight-knit uh, group or, or or what have you. But but there are guys there that I know. And I don't think that I've I don't think I've, I've mentioned to, to any of them that I'm planning on doing this. That might be a good thing to do. They might well, just give me you some know, encouragement. A community center, I wouldn't think, would be your best bet as far as if you want to feel that tight-knit family that Doug and I, and, and probably you too, John, uh, <clears throat> were involved in. If you have some little dirty hole-in-the-wall iron pit gym, you know, like the old days where, where there is a tight knitness that you could go to and train instead. Yeah, we had we had the same thing at John DeCola's gym and it was it, it was it was wonderful. Um, I mean, I've never had so many laughs in my life and just a real tight group of people supporting each other, helping each other. Um, and it sounds very much like Pearl's gym. Yeah, well, I, I will say that as helpful as that is to have that as valuable as it is to have that. Um, obviously because circumstances have changed now with COVID. Um, mm. and even without the COVID thing, I would say that there, there, there should be a way that people can find motivation without relying on, um, that setting. Um, because at the end of the day, you know, a lot of the people that, you know, went with me to these bodybuilding contests, I don't, I haven't talked to them for years. Right. right? So those friendships are transient anyway. I mean, they're, they're fun at the moment but they're not that meaningful in the long run. Um, and if I look back and I say, could I have done it without that? I would now look back and say, yes, I could have done it without that, but I had to, I would have had to have a different, I would have had to have the value system I have now. Mm -hmm. and, and I didn't have it back then. I think when we're younger, we rely more on the approval of others. Sure. And that's why that camaraderie thing works. But you get to an age where you realize that the approval of others doesn't really matter that at the end of the day, you need your own approval. You need to be happy with your own achievement, yeah. your own work. Yeah. And so in hindsight, I would say, it's always good if we were parents and we were telling our kids something, I would say, learn self-reliance. Don't depend on the approval of others. It's nice if you have it, but don't let that, let's say, bring your world down just because you don't have a circle of friends and you know an iron pit gym, that it's gonna somehow change your productivity you should be maximally productive based on your own value system and your own self-worth rather than relying on others to do that. So don't begrudge if you don't have that. You don't really need it. Well, okay. Yeah. Okay. The, the thing that it helped me with, uh, Doug, um, I was motivated without the group. But what the group mostly did for me was not a motivational thing uh, because I can train at home and be totally motivated. That's just the way my mind works and waits. But for me, it was taking the fear away of going to a show, you know, like if I was going to a show by myself, um, it's, it's easier to go to a show with people, you know, and, and you're part of that camaraderie. So I wasn't using it so much for the 
the motivation as far as training hard, because like you say, I was, all, you know, we were already training to the max and I can do that actually best on my own, I think, or with, you know, just one training partner, but it, it just made it easier, especially in my first uh, shows, knowing that you had a support group in the audience. No doubt. Well, it was we're, there we're for you, you know. And that was the second part of my conversation with Doug Brignoli, Steve Green, and John Taylor. I hope you enjoyed the talk. If you did, feel free to give it a thumbs up. If you know someone who is thinking about getting into a competition, but they haven't done it before, send it along to them. And by all means, subscribe if you feel so inclined. Thank you very much for watching. You guys are awesome, and I'll talk to you soon. <laughs>